Hello, this is Rachel, and today we are covering topic 13 from our supervision curriculum, and today's topic is functions of behavior. So first of all, let's start by talking about what is a problem behavior or when is behavior a problem? And I'm putting that in quotes because no behavior by itself is a problem. And we'll talk about that. But specifically, behaviors can create difficulties both for the learner and for the environment. Um, behavior is observable, definable, and measurable. And a behavior is considered overly adapted as opposed to problematic or challenging or disruptive because those are very subjective terms. Um, a behavior is overly adapted when it occurs too much, too little, or in the wrong place or time, when it poses a risk to that individual or others, or if it interferes with the ability for the learner to engage with their everyday activities or learning. So we have to think about behaviors um, in the context of function, because overly adapted behaviors are just behaviors that are meeting a need, but maybe meeting it in a way that isn't compatible with that current environment or puts the learner at risk. Some examples of behaviors that are often considered overly adapted um, would be self injurious behavior aggression, property destruction, inappropriate sexual behavior, tantrums, elopement, which is running away, pica, which is the ingestion of inedible objects, and inappropriate verbal behavior. Even those terms often have the words inappropriate in them, which again, can be subjective. So we're talking about inappropriate in the sense of that context does not support those behaviors. So a, a behavior might be appropriate in one setting and inappropriate in another setting. The behavior itself is not the problem. It's a discrimination between when and where should I be using that particular behavior. So all behavior, as we know, happens for a reason. That reason is the function of the behavior. It's the consequence that is maintaining or increasing the likelihood of the occurrence of the behavior. We know that individuals don't behave randomly. They do things that work, that meet their needs. So overly adapted behaviors are meeting a need for that learner. They may not be the most efficient or effective way to meet that need for that situation, but they are meeting a need. Otherwise, the learner wouldn't be using them. The learner would not be engaging in those skills. So when we talk about function of behavior, we're talking about trying to figure out what need is that meeting for the learner so that we can help the learner be more efficient and effective in each environment to get their needs met. Oftentimes, when people talk about functions of behavior, they list escape, attention, tangible, and sensory. Um, we are going to talk about those, but in the context of a more scientific framework. Those terms might be very useful when describing function-based interventions to individuals who don't have a behavioral vocabulary. Um, because as you have probably figured out by now, um, behavior analysts like to name things and call things based upon their function or what they do and not based upon how they look, which can be kind of confusing when we start talking about things like positives and negatives and punishment and reinforcement, the terminology can get confusing. So having common functions like attention, escape, tangible, and sensory can be very helpful when discussing with non people without that behavioral terminology background. 
However, if you think that those are the only four functions, you are mistaken. There are a lot of things that can occur or nuances that happen within those. And those in and of themselves are not inclusive enough to, um, or specific enough to really guide a function-based intervention, which is the whole point of determining the function so that we can help the learner be more successful, be more efficient, be more effective in getting their needs met. We have to know what those needs are. So our goal with determining function is to figure out the need. Um, those four do not list every possible need. So let's talk about how we can frame functions in a way that would encompass everything and give us guidance for how do we um, assist the learner in meeting their needs. So um, when we talk about functions, I'll show you the grid in a minute. When we talk about the functions, there are a couple of dimensions. So the first is going to be whether or not that function, that consequence, that need can be met by another person or whether that need is met by performing the behavior itself. So we basically have social, it involves another person having to meet that need, or it's automatic. The behavior itself results in the meeting of the need. So social, if I was looking for um, uh, comfort or reassurance, or um, even just things like I want a hug or I can't reach this item without some assistance, those are social. It requires another person to meet the need. Automatic behaviors don't require another person. So if I can perform the action and the action itself results in meeting the need, like I can turn on the light switch to produce the light, I can get the ladder and climb up the ladder and reach things on my own. I can, um, I can rock back and forth to soothe my anxiety and that, that rocking produces uh, the the meets the need that I have, then it's automatic. It doesn't require another person. So those are two things. It can either be social or it's automatic. There's not really a third option. It either needs somebody else to meet the need or the behavior meets the need in and of itself. Okay. The other uh the other dynamic or the other um, piece that we want to consider when we're talking about function is going back to that like positive and negative. Now, positive and negative in behavior analytic terms just means addition and subtraction, plus and minus. It doesn't have the context of good or bad. It's just add or subtract, plus or minus, positive, negative. So when we start talking about needing a need, needs are either adding something to the environment or taking something away from the environment. Because if my need is met, I don't need to change anything, right? If, if the environment is exactly what I need right now, then nothing changes. But if we make a change, the change either has to be addition to the environment or subtraction from the environment. So, um, positive, we've added something to the environment that that behavior adds something that consequence adds something to the environment. Negative, we're removing something from the environment. Generally speaking, positive, we are adding uh, something that the individual wants. Negative, we are removing something that the individual does not want. Now, if we have all four of those, we can draw them out in this grid. So um, I think they're called the Punnett square, right? Where you have social and automatic and you have positive and negative. Those are the, the two dimensions um, and two of each. So we result in four squares. 
So you have social positive, which means that the uh, reinforcer is something added to the environment by another person. The other person has to add something to the environment. That's the need so that the need gets met. Um, we also have automatic positive. So automatic positive, the behavior itself adds something to the environment. Then we have negative social or social negative, which would be another person removes something from the environment to meet the need. And we have automatic negative, which means that the behavior itself removes something from the environment to meet the need. So examples, social positive, someone adding something to the environment. This would include attention and tangible. So it requires another person to provide the attention, to give the response. This would also include things like comfort, um, social interaction, um, tangible. When we talk about, oh, they're uh, a, a tangible function, we're talking about the learner is engaging in a behavior to, that, so that somebody else delivers them what they need. So tangible would also be social positive. If I can't get the item myself, but I can engage in a behavior that results in you giving the item to me, that is social positive. So you can already see that two of the four common functions actually fit into social positive. Social negative, um, on the other hand, is going to be the, the, the person, someone else removing something from the environment um, to meet that need. So this might be someone else is removing the demand. Someone else is in charge of the, um, uh, the, the environment and, and can change and remove aversive things from the environment. Um, someone else is the one that is keeping the learner in that location or in that environment. And they can, um, and they can be the ones to let the learner leave or excuse them from the environment. So, um, social negative is going to be like your escape and avoidance behaviors. Um, it is, uh, getting someone else to remove the aversive that is uh, that needs to be removed to meet the learner's needs. But I can't, the learner can't do it themselves. I can't do it myself. I need you to take this away because I can't control that piece of it, right? Um, so that's social negative. Now we have automatic positive and automatic negative. When people say sensory, they don't differentiate between whether that is adding something to the environment or removing something from the environment. Lots of things get labeled sensory, which might be synonymous with automatic, but that doesn't really tell us, are we adding or subtracting from the environment, which is really going to matter if we are trying to meet the learner's needs. We need to understand, are they doing this because they need something? added to their environment or to get something out. So automatic positive would be adding to the environment. So this might be what gets labeled as stereotypy or stimming behaviors sometimes um, would serve an automatic positive. If I'm bored and I'm fidgeting with things, I'm adding sensation to keep my mind awake because I'm bored, right? If I am um, uh, if I'm in an environment that doesn't have a lot going on and I start engaging in, um, a behavior, uh, like, uh, moving my fingers in front or playing with a toy car or anything like that, I am adding sensations. I'm adding activities to my environment. That behavior produces the response. Um, meets my need. Automatic negative, on the other hand, is about removing aversives or painful stimuli. So 
behaviors that might be like self-soothing behaviors or comforting behaviors might be automatic negative. Um, if I rock so that I can um, relieve stress or anxiety, or I pick my nails or I bite my nails um, because I'm anxious and that helps me feel better, those would be automatic negative in that context. Um, automatic negative also might be the things that we do when we are in pain to try and feel better. So if I have a headache, I might rub my head because this might help my headache to feel better for a little bit. Um, if, uh, I, I know I do this, like if I'm, um, uh, clenching my teeth or holding my shoulders in a certain way because I'm stressed, right. Or because there's, there's pain, you might start doing things in a different way and favoring how you're doing things, um, because you're, uh, removing the pain or lessening the pain. So it's super important that we help distinguish between automatic positive and automatic negative because automatic negative, that's where you um, might run into medical issues that need to be addressed, mental health issues that need additional support or treatment, um, and, and other types of uh, pain situations that the learner is trying to remediate and doesn't have another way to address those uh, pain and discomfort situations. Um, so we need to address the underlying aspect, um, but we have to know what are they trying to, are they trying to remove something and what are they trying to remove? With automatic positive, it's the same thing. If my learner is um, needs more stimulation or needs more uh, sensory input, we need to know that that's what they're doing so that we can provide that in the environment more. And we'll talk a lot about this when we start talking about um, function-based behavior intervention plans, which is in a future topic. But just to reiterate, the purpose of discovering the function is so that we can help the learner get that need met. The function is the unmet need, is, the, is what they need. So our job is to determine the function so that we can meet those needs. Um, we can address the, uh, the medical or mental health situations that need additional support. We can create the environment that you know, provides this necessary stimulation. We can um, remove the things uh, that other people are applying or um, presenting to this individual that they uh, can't handle right now. And we can add the things that the individual wants and needs um, to be delivered by other people. So our goal with determining function is to support the learner, is to meet those needs. It's not to um, try and get them over it or power through it or anything like that. The purpose of the function is to determine a more efficient and effective way to help that learner meet those needs in that environment. So how do we identify functions of behavior? Um, we can use a functional behavior assessment, which has three parts, and we'll talk more about um, the third one in a future topic because it's a whole thing in and of itself. Um, but an FBA or functional behavior assessment um, is used to help determine the functions of these those overly adapted behaviors. Um, it consists of interviews direct observation and functional analysis. So we'll touch upon functional analysis, but that's its own topic in and of itself in the future. Um, interviews, so for interviews, those indirect assessments, you're gonna ask the individual or talk to the individuals that are in the natural environment, like 
parents, caregivers, teachers, peers, and ask questions around the situations under which the uh, overly adapted behavior is occurring so that you can look for patterns. Um, also, you know, asking the learners uh, if, if they can communicate with you on it, why they're engaging in some behaviors so that you can better understand their perspective. Um, looking for uh, differences in the way that uh, the behaviors, uh, the behavior is being interpreted as well. Um, sometimes, which again goes back to why we say overly adapted and, and it's very uh, setting um, specific is because some behaviors might be um, a, appropriate in one setting and inappropriate in another. But even the difference might just be in who's present. I might be able to tolerate a different level of volume um, than someone else. So I might not identify that behavior as a, a challenge in my setting because it's not, whereas someone else um, might find that. So getting those perspectives, understanding the context, and especially if you're able to talking with the learner and asking them why. Um, sometimes that piece gets skipped and we try to solve this mystery of, I don't know why the learner is doing this behavior, but nobody asked the learner. Um, sometimes, learners and ourselves included, right? Everybody, we're not able to say why because we haven't spent that much time thinking about it or we just don't know um, the contingencies that are necessarily controlling our behavior. Um, oftentimes you might ask a learner and they're like, I don't know, I just do. Um, that's okay, right? But sometimes they might have some insight and be able to say, oh, well, here's why or, Here's, um, you know, here's some of the factors that go into uh, when that behavior happens, right? So asking them. Um, the second part of an FBA is the descriptive analysis. So this is going to be direct observation, watching and seeing what is happening. Um, interviews can give us ideas around what the context is. They can definitely help us write good operational definitions and they can help us plan our observations. But people might not see all the aspects because they're engaged in the activity as well. So it's more challenging to report upon what's happening if you are also part of that action. Whereas in a direct observation, that descriptive analysis piece, you've got an outside observer who can go in, make videotape or go in and watch and take notes and catch lots of different factors that might all be occurring at the same time. Most of the time when we're doing um, direct observation and trying to determine function, we are taking ABC data, um, antecedent behavior consequence, and a lot of details around that, okay? Just ABC by itself um, may not be sufficient. Um, when I do uh, ABC data, I'm also taking things like um, the start time, the end time, obviously the date, um, who's there, where they are, um, what activity was going on before this, um, you know, sequence started, um, if there are any uh, motivating operations in effect. Um, so what else might be playing into, you know, did they sleep well, have their medic, has their medication changed, um, is, is a parent um, not at home right now who's usually there or a caregiver uh, schedule has changed? Um, you know, anything like that. Are they hungry? Like all of those things can factor into your antecedents. And then you have your immediate antecedent, which was sort of like whatever the, the very last thing that happened right before the behavior. Then you describe your behavior. And then you write out consequences. And the consequences are not necessarily like disciplinary actions, but what happened. So as a result of 
the learner knocking over their desk, they were sent out of class to go talk to the security officer. That's the result. Um, they got to leave class and they got one-on-one -on -one adult attention, um, right? So those would be things that I would need to consider and be aware of um, because if I look at those patterns, I might see that every time the learner um, is having challenge with the work, they vocally express that they don't want to do this work or that they can't do this work. And then when they are not provided with any additional support or they are redirected back to the task, they engage in knocking over furniture, um, doing something that is, is uh, disruptive in that environment or overly adapted for that environment. And that results in removal from the classroom, removal of that demand and additional adult attention. That is a pattern that we would need to recognize and look at so that we could help the learner get their needs met in a better way than knocking over the furniture because it's working, they're doing it. So that's working. And therefore we need to find a better way to help them meet that need. So we have to determine what that need is. So antecedent behavior consequence, um, taking that data. Uh, descriptive analysis also is gonna include describing the environment, um, you know, especially if, uh, if it's a possibility that the environment itself and not necessarily maybe specific um, demands or instructions, but the environment itself is the problem. Um, it's too loud, it's too cold, it's, uh, you know, there's too many people here. Whatever it is, we need to describe those aspects as well. So that's your descriptive analysis, your direct observation. Um, that can give you patterns and patterns can are, are correlations. We know that these things are likely to occur together. This happens, this is very likely. Um, so these are very likely uh, patterns and correlations. It doesn't tell us for sure what the function is. A functional analysis is actually going to experimentally manipulate what happens first, what happens after, um, so that we can see for sure if this happens, then this happens, or this happens when this other thing happens. We can determine for sure because we're changing those variables and we're taking data on that. And like I said, functional analysis, we will have a whole topic about that in the future and, um, and go into a lot more data with, or a lot more de detail on the functional analysis piece. But functional analysis would be proof as to conclusively determine what a function is, descriptive analysis, ABC data, those are going to give you a hypothesis and, um, and, and a correlation, um, it might be a best guess. So sometimes it's appropriate to intervene at that point, um, but it's a guess. We're operating on a hypothesis at that point. The functional analysis would actually test that hypothesis and confirm yes or no, are we right? So that's functions of behavior. Um, the assignment, Identify the four technical types of the behavioral functions. Those are, that's the grid that I explained to you. Social positive, social negative, automatic positive, automatic negative. Describe those. Um, identify the four most common terms for describing functions of behavior. So these are probably the ones that you hear um, people talk about, um, but they aren't inclusive of everything. And they're not as descriptive as they could be to um, help us help the learner. And then three, describe how the ABC chart provides information for identifying the function, a hypothesis for the function of the behavior. Thank you.
uh, for watching. As always, if you want to, you can place your answers to the assignments down in the comments, and I'm happy to provide feedback. Um, please subscribe if you'd like to continue to see these as they come out, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.